Good evening, President Miller, Provost Hill, members of the Board of Visitors, distinguished guests, faculty, staff, students, and friends and family of Virginia State University. I'd like to express my sincere thanks for being extended the opportunity to introduce the keynote speaker for this year's opening convocation. Now, if you turn in your program, you'll see a page detailing the very impressive and quite substantial biography of Lacey B. Ward, Jr. As you read the biography, you will note uh, the, the unique array of institutions and public officials with whom he has been affiliated. You will see that he's a distinguished alumnus of this fine university and that he has been an administrator and a faculty member at, at other universities such as Longwood and Tuskegee. You will note his wartime service to our country in the Navy and his deep political experience working with both Democratic and Republican members of Congress. You will also note his service on many boards and, commu and committees at the local, state, and national level. However, what the words on that page cannot truly convey is the depth of Lacey's dedication to the cause of freedom and citizenship and his lifelong devotion to education and the development of people for all, from all walks of life. I can personally attest to these facets of Lacey's career because it was some 18 years ago after hearing from my father of my own interest in getting to know the world of government and politics that Lacey actually offered me what turned out to be my very first internship. And I note that because this is an event for students, and I want you all to understand that these things really do matter, the internships and the opportunities that you get even decades and decades later. During that time 18 years ago, I had this pleasure to spend a few weeks shadowing him on his job, watching as he helped then-Congressman L.F. Payne serve the people of Virginia's 5th Congressional District. During that internship, he introduced me to a project that many people at the time in that area and around the state felt was just a little bit foolish, the preservation and renovation of the long-neglected, historically black R.R. R. Moton High School in Farmville, Virginia. Over those past 18 years, first as a volunteer and activist, and later as the CEO, through plenty of blood, sweat, and tears, Lacey has turned that neglected old building into what is arguably the premier destination for the presentation and advancement of the story of civil rights history in the entire Commonwealth of Virginia. It is truly an institution of national significance. As the great American writer William Faulkner once said about the South, the past is never dead, it's not even past. At what is now the Robert Russell Moton Museum for Civil Rights and Education, not only is the past not dead, it, is very mu it very much comes alive and speaks to the continuing struggle to define equality for all Americans in these turbulent times. At Moton, Lacey and his dedicated team are making history each and every day. He continues to serve as a mentor and friend to me and countless other individuals and professionals from diverse backgrounds, and so it is with great pride and admiration that I offer my thanks and extend a warm Trojan welcome to one of Virginia State's own loyal sons, Lacey B. Ward, Jr. Thank you, Conaway. Come on, you all really know what's the most important thing in my resume, and what is that? VSU. Graduated from VSU. <laughs> if you want to learn how to wheel and deal and move and operate and float in and out and work the inner workings of those things which run the university, which run the state, which run the nation, you're going to learn it here at VSU. I can tell you, being an officer in student government at VSU was much harder than being an officer at any other position I've had. Uh, I was really tested here, and I very much appreciate it. I appreciate that I can look out and, you know, it's been three decades, it's been 30 years since I went to class at VSU, but I still see people that when I look across the room, we walk up to each other, it's a warm hug, it's an embrace, it's just a great love of being a fellow Trojan. And I'm just glad to be here tonight and be able to speak to you, my fellow Trojans, about what I've been able to do in life because, because I got my start right here in Ettrick. Uh, I want to extend my sincere thanks to President Keith Miller for the invitation to deliver this address. Thank you for, so much for, for reaching out to the hinterlands of Farmville and finding me and saying, come on down to Petersburg. Uh, it's indeed an honor to greet you in what very formally we would say is this the year of our Lord, 2013? And I love to look at anniversaries and, and remind you that not only is that the year that it is, but 
This is also the 237th year of our nation's independence. And as you saw celebrated in January of this year, it's the 150th anniversary of our nation's emancipation. I know most people will say that Lincoln emancipated the slaves. And I want you to get an understanding of the inner workings and the way we look at our history and the way we're moving forward now that we find ourselves not as the people of the minority, but I want you to really embrace this concept. We are the people of the emerging majority. And, and I know we haven't always felt that way, thought that way. We, we, we really wondered, do we have a right to be in the room? Do our opinions matter? Do we really need to tell people how to live? Do they want to lead? We are, at least you all are, this generation, an emerging majority in America. And, and that's not the way we've always addressed people at Virginia State. I think we've been maybe too apologetic about being the minority. But when I look back 150 years ago, and I see the words that Abraham Lincoln penned, I know deep down he wasn't only freeing those enslaved. He wasn't only freeing my great-grandparents and many of y'all's great-grandparents. He was freeing the nation from an original sin that were she not freed from would continue to haunt us to this day. So I'm happy to be here on the 150th anniversary of the emancipation of the nation. I'm also happy to be here on the 50th anniversary, very close there too, of Martin Luther King's dream. And it was really with the reflective programming and looking back and, you know, every special I saw, the question I heard was this, what has become of King's dream? You all heard that. What has become of King's dream? And, and young people, you have to learn to separate your dreams from your realities. As I heard the commentators talk about what has happened to King's dream, what I heard them describing was reality, the current state of affairs. And you see, King was not speaking to reality. He had removed himself. He had done that thing that only the soul can do, which is to remove yourself from your body and within your dreams to see what that new reality will be. So what's become of King's dream? In the sense of the soul, it continues to be a dream at will in all time. We are imperfect beings. We will forever be imperfect. But that does not mean we cannot be about the business of self-perfecting. So yes, King's dream is still a dream. Yes, there's still an ideal to be achieved, but I can tell you the reality of when I was two years old is not the same reality of today when I am 52 years old. <laughs> King's dream lives. King dreamed of an America, and it's happening, it's coming, of an America where people were judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And maybe in some strange mathematical formula of the universe, because we couldn't seem to quite figure out how to not judge each other by the skin of color, somewhere through immigration and intermarriage and living in the county in the country for a long time it seems that's what's happening is that paradigm i was born into of you know basically in america there are two races there's white and there's color and that's what it was like in 1961 when i was born that was the reality but in some strange way some long, morally bending art, that reality is escaping us. And it's driving the demographers mad. It's driving the Census Bureau crazy. Because they can't figure out how to assemble a group of people in such manner 
then we can clearly know that we have a majority because if we have a majority and we live in a democracy and we know who the majority is, we know the majority rules, we know what the norm is. Young people, you are part of the emerging majority of America. This country will no longer be governed the way it was governed. Will it be governed toward the ideal of all men created equal? Indeed it shall, but will it be governed to the ideal of majority rule? It shall not. How do we form majorities in current day America? How do we figure out what the rule, the norm, the standard will be? Who voted in 2012 in the presidential election? Did you vote in the minority, as in your candidate lost? Or did you vote in the majority, as in your candidate won? I should ask that again. It's okay. I feel like a college professor. You have to say this from time to time. Yes, participation is encouraged. There was an election in 2012. Who voted? Did your candidate lose, as in you were in the minority? Did your candidate win, as you were in the majority? Feel it, embrace it, understand it. You are the emerging majority of the United States of America. Great rights and great responsibility will befall your shoulders because you live at this point in time and you're being prepared at this point in time in this institution. And you don't know how fortunate you are because to be able to think and feel and dreams and make reality follow your dreams is something that is just within the ethos of a place like Virginia State University. This college is not very old. I serve on the Board of Visitors at Longwood University, one of your sister institutions. Yes, it predates the Civil War. Yes, it's one of the 100 oldest colleges in America. But it hasn't been born of the blood that Virginia State has been born of. You young people are born of the ashes of the Civil War. You are born of the Reconstruction. You are born of Jim Crow. You are born of that little engine that could. You're born of those people who, cast into the minority in a democratic country where the majority rules, found a way through faith, hard work, dedication, service to come to a place where what we can give to you, our next generation, the blessings of being the emerging majority. You have a great responsibility that now falls upon your shoulders. You're probably wondering at about this time, you know, what, what, what is it that even gives you the belief, the comprehension, understanding? What is it that gives you the desire to even say things like that to an audience of fellow Trojans? Where do you come to that type of understanding? I told you in many ways a part of that is just, it's just being in the classroom here. It's being in a place where you know the faculty has always been underpaid. The students have always been under-resourced. The General Assembly has always looked down on us. But somehow, as we came to a point in 2012 where we would shape the future direction of our nation, those who were handling the presidential candidate who wanted that prize possession, 13 electoral votes of the Commonwealth of Virginia, so the people are handling that candidate in 2012, and they're looking out and saying, where will I find my majority? I think I tried to get my dad here to an awards program for the Agriculture Department sometime very close to the election. I don't know who the scheduler was that caused this, but we found ourselves in a tremendous traffic jam on the Triple Nickel Bridge trying to get to Virginia State because some guest more important than I or my dad was coming to Virginia State very close to the election. Does anybody know who I'm talking about? 
Why was she here? What was she seeking? A majority of the votes of the Commonwealth of Virginia. And what did her handlers recognize? Where is the emerging majority? It's on the campus of Virginia State University. It's on the campus of Virginia State. So they knew it. They knew it. But how did I come to know it? I start my resume, and boy, it's, it's, like, it's like writing for a small town paper. Some of you journalist majors may do this one day. And you'll find when you write for a small town paper, anything you mail in probably gets printed. <laughs> so the bio I mailed in got fully printed in the program. No editing. But here's what's important about that bio. I don't start talking about myself. I'll give you my name. But I want you to know what it is that my home county, Prince Edward County, Virginia, wasn't born there, got there as soon as I could. My home county, Prince Edward County, Virginia, what it gave me in making it possible for me to understand America, where she'd come from, and where she's headed. I'm very fortunate to live in Prince Edward County. I was very fortunate to live there in the 1970s. I was very fortunate to live there only a decade after the return, yes, the return of public education to Prince Edward County, Virginia. You see, there was a five-year stretch there from 1959 to 1964 in which not a single public school operated in Prince Edward County. There's a five-year stretch there where not a single, and I don't know why I always have to say this, but I have to say it because we're still in that two-race paradigm, right? Not a single school, black or white, operated between the years 1959 and 1964. Yes, I was born right in the midst of that. And so I got to go to a school where my teachers, some of them began their careers in segregated schools. Some of them lost their jobs when schools closed. Some of them came back when schools reopened and they became the lead teachers of those schools. And what I observed, it was very interesting. I, I went to an integrated high school, but it wasn't overly integrated. And I think when you all talk about integration today, probably what you're thinking of is integration means a small number of those who belong to the ethnic group, colored, black, African-American, whichever term we're using at the current time, a small number of them go to a school where the larger number of them are what we would call white or Caucasian. In my school, it was the exact opposite. The majority of the white citizens in my county were pulled out of the public schools and placed into a private school. So in my school, which was integrated, in my school, which had at one time been named for Robert Russell Moton, the second president of Tuskegee, and you know the code, if a school's named for a black person, it's a black school, it's named for a white person, it's a white school. But in my school, the majority norm was the descendants of what the world saw as the minority, or what the nation saw as the minority. And so I knew at a very young age that even in an integrated environment, what we call minority demographically or through the Census Bureau can be majority, can be the norm, can be the standard. I learned that in Prince Edward County, Virginia. And I continue to exercise it today. Some of the interactions I've had with people who have a difficulty in really understanding this concept. There's a memorial in Richmond. It's called the Virginia Civil Rights Memorial. I'm looking at Oliver Hill, Jr. His dad is there in bronze. But your dad became famous to go there probably in his 40s or 50s, well into his professional career. If we turn the corner of that monument, we find another figure in bronze of a young girl who, at the time of creating history, was only 16 years old, who, at the time of creating history, didn't even have a high school diploma. She was still enrolled as a junior. Barbara Johns. And so the memorial was built. It's a very beautiful memorial, the Virginia Civil Rights Memorial. And 
I've had people remark, wow, such a wonderful, articulate, faithful, determined, young, African-American woman. She should be a role model for all African-American women. To which I say, hold up. She is a citizen of these great United States of America who understood constitutionally how to move for redress of her grievances when she found herself in a situation where she's not being treated equally as a citizen. She is a role model for the ideal American. And so based on this history of my teachers in the 70s, this iconic teenage figure, and an understanding that we still weren't quite where we needed to be to know that the norms developed from the minority experience might be those which best help us govern in this crazy complex world we live in now when we become the emerging majority. And so I will tell you that at the root of the way that museum is built, and you're not going to get the full description, this is called a commercial. What I'm saying is at some point you all need to drive to Farmville and visit the Robert Russell Moden Museum. So if you want the full story, pay the full price of admission, come get the tour, and I'll give you all of it. Right now you only get snippets. But I can tell you this, that orientationally, as I went into that exhibit, and as I commanded teams of writers and researchers and archivists and architects and other designers, I told them this one thing. The story of these people will not be a story restricted by race. We're not here to be role models for ourselves. We've told our stories to ourselves. We've passed it down through the generations. But we see a nation in need of hope. And so we're going to tell our story and our voice to our entire nation. Because another thing King picked up, and he, he picked this up from the gospel, and he paraphrased, and, and people often do. But you know the story of the Savior coming to save the Jews, but deciding and fulfilling that mission, he would not save only the Jews, but would save all humanity. And I think it would be an extreme farce for those of us who have moved from minority to majority status through the inner workings of a nation that allowed us that opportunity to then come into the majority and pretend that our lessons do not apply to everyone. And so I say we're going to build a museum where everyone is embraced. I told you about the school where most of the white students in my community were taken out of the public schools and placed into. I sent the researchers into their archives. I said, get their pictures. I said, what do you mean? I said, there's a period of history in which this entire county is involved in a process of integration. If someone walks in my museum, I want them to see pictures of everyone who lived here during that transformation and understand what it meant in their household. Got a little bit of pushback. If I talk to people who've been in black schools, they say, why are we putting the white folks in our museum? If I talk to the folks who went to white schools, they say, why are you putting our pictures in your museum? And I say, because it's a history about integration. And it would be blasphemous to segregate an integration museum. Uh, it was a hard concept to get across, but I can tell you this. Once it had been transmitted to designers, once it had been built, once it existed, once we invited the entire community in, I saw some learning going on. I, I saw people who only had the white story opening up and saying, this is what we thought. And I saw people who'd only heard the black story listening. It was a place where that could happen. You all have proven 
in the election of 2008 and the election of 2012 that the old coalitions of majority, the old definition of majority that got us our elected leaders in the past will not get us our elected leaders in the future. You all, young people, have proven that it won't be simple majority that wins elections. It will be majority by coalition. We used to just call it colored. You call it people of color. You, you found a way to embrace Asians and Hispanics and, and still make it one cause. Maybe we used to call it colored men. You found a way to embrace women, not just to bake pies and get out the vote, but to actually participate in the, in the preparation and implementation of strategy. You've not only crossed gender lines, you've crossed sexual orientation lines. And you've said, this is the coalition that is the new majority. It's an exciting time. Um, I don't want to come back and take Calculus two again. I don't want to be a student. <laughs> but I'm just so glad that, you know, my dad, who attended Virginia State, in the era of Jim Crow, and I'm sure he never thought of himself as a majority in Virginia. Um, or me, who attended it in the early days of integration, you know, I still couldn't quite see this majority vision. Um, but I can tell you today, you know, I, I've been appointed to things by, by Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. I've been appointed by George Bush. Um, everyone knows. We are the emerging majority. Our votes will be highly sought. They will be coveted. People will be coming after you. What do you need to do? You need to prepare yourself to be that power broker. You need to take on a majority mantle. You need to decide that you are going to be OK with the responsibility of setting the norm not trying to adapt to the norm, but setting the norm for the United States of America. It's a very difficult time for the president. And, and you know, it's, he, he, he's stuck in two worlds, to be quite honest. Um, he's got to live up to Martin Luther King. We've put that on his shoulders. But he's also got to live up to every other American president that came before him. He's stuck being president in this period of transition. What you all will do with your electoral power is determine for future presidents how to serve the needs of the new majority, not the old. Thank you for the opportunity to be here.